What is a brand? A brand, for lack of people who don't know, is a combination of your reputation, your body of work, and your overall uh, network, the relationships that you have. So when people, I know people are confused by the marketing jargon, but I want you to think about this. Brands come from the ancient you know, world and the concept of a brand would be a physical thing. It's branding and it would be a mark, but it's also a mark can be also called something else. A brand could be called a sigil. A brand can be called a crest, a br- and we often think of these things mm-hmm. as a logo. Now, the thing is, a brand isn't just a logo, but it does kind of encompass that because a logo is more than what it is. In in the Game of Thrones universe, for example, your how sigil is more than that. It's the representation of your family, your armies, your lands, your crown, all of that, but also your house words, like winter is coming, or we do not sow, or a, a Lannister always pays their debt. So, so it's a thing is, and the thing is it conveys who you are and the words that you stand by and what you uh, mean. If you're a Targaryen, it's fire and blood. So it's, it's talking about the conquest of Aegon when he came to King's Landing. So it's the story. A brand is largely representative of just, um, symbology, words, and things that are your story. And your story is your reputation. Welcome to Laser Everything. Uh, I'm taking the helm tonight, looks like. And so we've got Kyle, of course, and Alex to my left. And of course, we have Roberto Blake here as our special guest. Um, that, oh, oh, beautiful. That's new. Beautiful. Okay. Kyle, where is <laughs> ours? Why don't we have one of those? I keep saying <laughs> we need one. All right, do it. The soundboard, yes. <laughs> um, but just so you guys know, if you don't know who Roberto Blake is, uh, he has over 569,000 subscribers on YouTube with 36 million views and counting. Ridiculous. Um, he's done a hundred or fifteen hundred, over fifteen hundred educational videos for tech, gear, and uh, growth, business growth, mm. online, uh, multiple uh, streams of uh, revenue, stuff like that. And he now has a book that just came out called Creator, uh, the Creator Co- Create Something Awesome. Right there, right. it is. Link in the description. We're going to talk about yes. that too. Yeah, absolutely. He's been doing this for a long, 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 long time. And uh, so I asked Roberto to come on here to talk about the creator economy. Uh, because doing what we do with laser engraving, that's just we should pair these things up for physical sure. products versus the online product that could kind of bridge that gap. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. So, Roberto. So, what? What? First of all, what made you want to write a book after all this experience you've had? What? What made you put it in a book format? Uh, I was. Uh, if, you, if you can see the bookshelf behind me, I'm a reader. And I've always been a reader ever since I was a kid. Um, my parents, um, you know, read to me as a child. Um, actually, they even started like uh, first audiobooks. The first audiobooks usually were these books on tape. And the thing is, they, they used to be these fun things where they would have these big bird dolls where you could put the tape in the back. And so it would read to you. And so I had Big Bird and Teddy Ruxpin. And so when my parents, you know, weren't reading to me, we literally had an animatronic machine back in the old back in the olden days that could read to a kid. Today, it'd be something that looks like it's out of the uncanny valley and people think that's weird. But yeah. like, yeah, I had Big Bird and Teddy Ruxpin. I would read my books. I would I would read to other kids who couldn't read like it's a little people think that's a show offy thing. But it's like, no, it was fun for me mm-hmm. to teach people something they didn't know, whether it was video games, whether it was sports whether it was how to properly mimic the Ninja Turtles, like whatever it was, I enjoyed learning new things, always did, enjoyed reading and enjoyed um, teaching. And I, as I grew older and enjoyed writing my own stories as a child, as a child, I'd write my own stories. As a child, I made my own comic books by hand. And then I would like share them and pass them around to my friends and be like, hey, look at what I did. Look at what I wrote. Look at the story that I told. Because if I saw something and it brought me joy, I wanted to be able to do it myself. Like I was that kind of like, I'm like, oh, that brings me and other people joy. What if I could do that? What if I could be like the people that have made me so happy? And so I think that's a normal thing for a kid. I don't know where we lose that in life. I don't know where we lose that in life. But I think that creative people are the people who don't lose all of it. So maybe everybody here hasn't lost all of that, I think, over the years, no matter what life gives you. But I think there's nothing more pure and normal than for a kid to take pure joy in something 
and then whatever that thing is, they want to be able to mimic that thing or that person. And they say, you know what, that if like that person or that experience made me so happy. And I think that the best of us who are creators spend our whole life trying to chase that same feeling of creating that kind of joy for other people. Well, you know, I think this has been Alex's main punchline about this whole business is the idea of laser everything community is to create 10,000 other full-time uh, workers, you know, biz startup businesses that are laser creators. Nice. And so, you know, when it comes back to your, to your book, creator, uh, the creator economy, uh, create something yep. awesome, create something awesome. How creators yes. are profiting from their passion in the creator economy. Same mission, same mm -hmm. mission. Can I get 10,000, hundred thousand people to figure out how to monetize something that they create, that they mm -hmm. own, that they're passionate about, that they have, you know, the rights to their own intellectual property. Can they use and leverage the tools that exist today, their creativity and their smarts, and can they learn enough about business to where they own that instead of being taken advantage of by somebody else? Mm. So well, our thing is most of our people aren't creators. They make like in the creator economy, like the uh, the social media aspect. YouTubers, of it. influencers, yeah. Right. That's right. just so, an application, by the way. Mm, it's right. just an application of a thing that you're doing because the platforms let you scale it. That's what the usage is. So mm -hmm. so people like that are watching our show or listening to our show, they can still benefit from this creator mindset. They 100% can because even if you're an analog creator, here's the thing. If you're an analog person, how does someone learn your craft? You could be building – like I wrote a book to pass on the lessons I've learned – and put everything I learned about digital platforms into an analog book that can outlive me that even 10 years from now will not be as dated as people think because of the way that I wrote it. And it still will matter. And the thing is I can update that over time, release other editions. I'm writing a second book now, but think about it. Anybody who's a craftsperson or analog can take their knowledge and can package their knowledge in physical form but you can scale it because a physical book that you wrote still has a digital file. You word, wrote it in Microsoft Word. So it can be an ebook. And then if you read and perform it out loud or you pay someone else to, I'm going to perform mine out loud. You have an audio book, which means people can passively listening if that's how they interpret their knowledge. How is that different than a lecture, a professor that they lecture from to learn the same information? So even if you're a craftsman, even if you're a craftsman, here's the thing. If you own a machine shop, maybe it's not going to be a book that teaches someone how to be a machinist but it could teach them how to start a machinist business. You could talk to them about negotiating with the bank, about leasing their machinery, and about how to pick a proper space and any number of things that can be orally learned. So there's mm -hmm. all kinds of things. And these platforms, remember, these platforms scale things. Even if you own a business like that, you own a business where you use hand tools, the footage and video experience of that and challenges you're doing, that could be monetized. Yeah, I mean, one of the things, too, that we see a lot here on Laser Everything is our viewers are always trying to show their customers the work that they're doing, because this is a very visual industry, laser marking, right? We're like taking something physical and changing it. And that is what we're trying to display to the customer. So people are people are constantly trying to get up on TikTok, get up on Instagram, get up on Facebook. Does the camera matter here? Like, is it a is it, it a technical thing? You know, and I mean, if so, like, is it this can. somewhere you can be successful with like an iPhone or, or what's the deal there? OK, in theory, the iPhone makes it accessible to do something because it's better than nothing. It's better than nothing. But actually, I want to get a visual prop for this. Hang on. This is why this is why Roberto's on because he's got the price. He's, he's ready. I Literally. Love yeah. Okay, just it's so like, you guys know, he also has right here. He has every Sony camera ever made. <laughs> he's got all of them. He still has his very first one. He had a video of his very first Sony camera to the, to the big dogs now. Like, and, and first of all, I want to uh, let's zoom in on this. Uh, I want to zoom in on that Star Wars helmet back there. Okay. It's a stormtrooper. This lens here is a special type of lens. It's called a macro lens. Does anyone here know what a macro lens does? All right, so Not half me. the panel does. So with a macro lens, you specifically get a focal length distance that would allow you to get close up on an object. Not And you don't have to zoom, you physically have to get closer. But the thing is, if you use even your iPhone, there's a point at which no matter how close you get, 
the object goes out of focus. We're all familiar with that, right? Yeah. Yep. With a macro lens, you can get basically a finger's breadth away from something and it'll still be in focus, which means you can get extreme detail, extreme mm. detail. In your industry, is there any scenario you can think of where extreme detail close up of an uh, inch away from something might actually matter to get Vir a shot? Virtually every instance would benefit from those. So tensions. that means that a macro lens that also has the ability to get much sharper detail because look at all the, there's more glass in any part of this lens than in your entire phone, which means you have a, you have a resource that is much more dedicated to capturing something at the best quality in a specific way and giving you much more control, right. much more control. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, yes, this is better than nothing. It's easy to use. It's easy to learn. And you can try and augment it to your heart's content. It still cannot compete with a dedicated camera and its capabilities because, again, more glass and more things and more dials and more control than this offers by far, and then a dedicated tool in terms of a lens to accomplish that. All of us here that are live streaming, we all have dedicated microphones. What's better, the microphone that you're using for the stream or the microphone in your uh, iPhone? The, the stream for sure, stream. clearly. Yeah. Because again, there's more technology and more things uh, dedicated to the detail precision of capturing a voice in a dedicated microphone and in an audio interface than in your phone right we've been conditioned and yes this is good enough to do something it's good enough to do something it's good enough to do a lot of things in many ways this is a much more convenient and accessible tool than what was used to make the original star wars or jurassic park <laughs> but it still can't fully compete it can make it can get you close as an amateur it can get you close and it can give you something but it's not quite the same thing now, is it? Because right. of the attention to detail, the overall quality, and the thing is, as a consumer, you will notice the difference. In, and the thing is, as a creator, this is what will get you started and will keep you from being discouraged and will give you a baseline. And the thing is, you can get pretty far because just showing up, this is what proves that showing up is more than half the battle. But in a world where everyone can show up, how do you stand out? Right. Because if showing up's half the battle, okay, now everyone showed up. Well, can I be more consistent than them? Okay, that's great. Now of the people being consistent, how do I outperform them if we're all using the same tool? I now have to use better tools of my trade than them. And also, there's a limited understanding of technique. This gives you a very limited, basic, and rudimentary understanding of photography, video, and audio. Because of its own limitations, you're only learning within the limitations of what the tool allows for. Because all the technique and all the mastery of the actual craft exist outside of what this tool offers. Right. There are things you'll never learn about video, photography, and lighting as long as you're shackled to this, it can get you started, but your ceiling, your ceiling is only so far as this allows for. When you use dedicated individual tools, each of those dedicated individual tools does its job better than that phone, which means the ceiling for your understanding and learning and your craftsmanship also extends to that. And that's why it's important. And so, when we say gear doesn't matter, what we should say if we want to be intellectually honest is that gear doesn't matter when you're just getting started and need to do something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I think a lot of people do need to do something, but a lot of people that are listening or watching are also ready to take the next step. I, it, I don't think a lot of people that are, are part of you know our regular audience see themselves as creators and you have to because you guys are all fighting for the same customers at the end of the day people who want to buy you know customized or personalized items and that you have to tell a story in order to make that sale you know and so these tools are going to be really paramount in making sure that you do get to stand out especially like you said like if everybody's showing up like what do you do next and so upgrading the tools i think is like a really 
important step that a lot of people may not necessarily consider themselves like you know worthy or ready to do but you you should do it because they don't again see themselves as creators they see themselves as laser engravers you know uh, but you have to be a a, a a creator to sell that yes if you want sales is storytelling mm-hmm. yeah. we it's not we don't buy utility we're human beings i wish we bought utility nobody <laughs> buys utility even us nerds don't always buy utility even in Again, even in convincing everybody here that the iPhone itself isn't enough, I had to paint a picture, tell a story. I had to even use a visual prop because it sends and conveys a message. And so getting someone to make a massive financial commitment requires storytelling because there's nothing that offers enough utility by itself that someone can intellectualize to be worth parting with the options that their money provides. Mm -hmm. Only a story can compel them to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and people do not realize that they're sold on a story because you don't buy clothes. You buy what you think clothes say about you. Wow. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's like, (laughs) think about it. Yeah. You don't buy, we're guys, we don't buy a car. Okay. We buy what a car says about us. Even when you're buying that first car, when you're a 20 something year old guy and you feel like a loser and a scrub because you have to give people gas money or your parents have to shuffle you around or you have to take public transportation, you're buying, you're not buying a car, you're buying freedom. You're not buying a car, you're buying independence. Mm -hmm. You're not buying a car, you're buying options. You're not buying a car, you're buying the option of picking a girl up on a date and not having the awkward interaction with bear, bear, borrowing the parent's car and the limitations that come with that or your friend taking you. Or even worse, your mom dropping you. Or your mom or... dropping you up. <laughs> like, Bye, like sweetie. I love Danny, you. Danny and Karate Kid, right? It's like yeah. having to sit there and like, you know, push the car out of the driveway. Yeah. And, and yeah, it's. <laughs> well, so, and see, I think what you're saying is actually really true. And it ties back to a, a guest we had a couple of weeks ago where it's like, so it's cool that you have the tools because that allows you to show up. Now that you've got the better tools, you can show out and now you can make the thing. But the other part of it, too, is. Who are you trying to tell that story to? And that's one of the big things. So knowing your audience and what uh, platform they're using. So if you're trying to sell an item to a young person, go on TikTok. They're going to be there and they've got income that's just ready to go. Uh, Versus if you're trying to sell something that's more utilitarian, like you said, what does it say about me? I want to buy this item for my, you know, for my man cave. Um, you go on Instagram because there's more, you know, not, Instagram, not young, but it's more of the middle aged group that's got that money to even, drop the big things. It's Instagram, Instagram is the concentration of affluence <clears throat> on yeah, the internet. Absolutely, because Instagram is driven by status and materialism psychologically. Mm-hmm. TikTok is driven by expression and rebellion and um, the, con- the 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 concept of randomness and silliness and identity. You know, it's like, uh, this is who I am. Like, TikTok's an entirely um, identity-driven uh, cultural phenomenon. Generational which, thing, yeah. Generationally, yeah, which is why I don't think it lasts more than five more years, because I think they'll grow up and sell out. Um, the Because <laughs> every generation thinks that they're too good to grow up and sell out, and then they learn. Right. Um, we've all, I think, lived long enough to understand <laughs> the reality of, like, that's, like, no, no yeah. one's Peter Pan forever. Yeah, It's like, that. go watch the movie Hook. It's a great movie. Everyone grows up and sells out. Yeah. TikTok clock. Before yeah. I you know I want to I want to talk about like the different platforms too, but before we get into that, I want to put a bow on this gear talk really quick and just okay. say a lot of a lot of the people again listening are mom and pop shops. They're people that have retired, they're looking to supplement their retirement in cl- income. They're not mm-hmm. uh y- the nerds, right? Okay, here's the so, great. Yeah. Yeah, so well, I was just going to say like where what what do what do you think these people should be looking at if they want to up their game, but we don't want to fly way off the handle, you know? All right. So here's the great news. Here's the great news. The the thing is, what if I told you that reasonably speaking, they can get a great all arounder? Like, let me ask you guys something from your perspective, a business owner, like a business owner, not a hobbyist, but a business owner, like you said, who's already invested into their craft. Sorry, I just need to turn do not disturb mode on. It's invested in their craft. Do you think that it's unreasonable to spend 
$2,000 as a one-time lifetime purchase to have essentially the best marketing apparatus in the world for multimedia at your disposal at all times? No, not no. at all. That's no Okay. Yeah. So, so for $700, you can get a Sony ZV-E10 camera. And for another $300 to $500, you can get uh, one or two lenses. Obviously, we know that we can get decent podcast-style microphones, but also you could get a YouTube-y vlog-like microphone for like another $100 $200, and that will be, to some extent, best-in-class audio, true best-in-class audio with a wireless mic or something like that, $200, $300. Okay. Yep. Yep. So by the time we do that, and by the time we get a reasonable lighting kit, three or $500, you have lights, camera, audio, and lenses, You're still, and you have a variety of them, and you're under $2,000. And the thing is with no additional accessories, you can plug this thing in. And by the way, you can get like one other like accessory and it'll basically for $150, you have a soundboard for $150 or whatever. $100, $300, you get a soundboard if you wanna do live streaming. This one camera can do all of your YouTube, do all of your product photography because you have your choice of two lenses that can help you do the product photography. So now you have the ability to do Instagram at a higher quality level than your phone and better than your competitors. And you can do it and you can have macro shots. You can have all these other things. You have a camera that allows you to directly talk to your customers in live streams at very high quality comparable to what I have now because yeah. I'm using a real camera and a real lens. You can do a very similar one with my, because uh, the, the thing I was telling you guys about, all right, watch, wa watch me switch to my sidearm. Boom. This Boom. is another camera. I can switch between these cameras. This camera is almost as good as camera one. And guess what the the, the thing is? This is a two hundred no $250 lens, $700 camera. That's a thousand bucks right there. I'm talking a, a $300, $400 microphone. You see, this is literally perfect quality and you can do anything and everything with it. This is, you could take this off of the mount I have it on. You could vlog with it, blah, 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 blah. So the thing is you could get to a reasonable place a sound a tool that is called Stream Deck that's a soundboard and could be a camera switcher. I have more complicated tools than this, but soundboard camera switcher, $150. There, so like for $2,000, you can have a marketing apparatus that makes you competitive with the top 10% of people in your industry because at your disposal, you have soundboards, live broadcast capabilities, the ability to do cinematic video and vlogging, make commercials, make ads. You could live stream and talk to an audience with it. You can do high level Instagram photography. It's a Lifetime purchase, $2,000 to have one of the best marketing apparatuses for multimedia at your disposal at all times. That is buying your battle station, that is buying your kit. And this assumes you already have a iPad or a laptop or a smartphone to do the backend editing and management of all this stuff or the interface, which most business owners already have. Mm -hmm. So supplementing your business with $1,500 to $2,000 worth of cameras, lights, and audio means that for the rest of your entire life and career, you now have the ability to compete in the arena with the at the base level of the top 10% of people in your industry. And you'll beat a lot of people there in the bottom of the 20% and everybody below that for sure. Yeah. Because they're all trying to do more with less. And you have just a little more, aka double the investment of the best phone they could have. Yeah. The same investment in probably the laptop or computer that you have gives you these extended capabilities at high quality. Mm -hmm. Out of the box, by the way. Yeah. And then the last question you're left to think about is do you have the your fantastic you know poster behind you to really tie it and sink it home, right? Right. That that really <laughs> sends it home. It, the thing you said about it being a lifetime purchase too, I, my first camera when I started my channel was a uh, Canon 5D Mark II. And when I bought it two years ago, it was over a decade old and it still looked really good it was a huge upgrade compared to other people that were trying to make videos about lasers you know so i it, it doesn't have to be uh it, i mean granted you know that sony very nice camera for sure and uh you should probably get a new camera because the old ones have some limitations but once mm. you get it it's going to last a long time because i was making videos with a 10 year old dslr and it was still pulling I'll tell it you, off i'll tell you a trick if you buy something new here's the value of buying something new i even talk about this a little bit in my book here's the value of buying something new as expensive as it might see or like oh i can get i can save a couple bucks buying used here's the thing everyone thinks that they're saving a couple bucks buying used what if I told you that when you buy something and you buy it quality and buy it once, you're buying it 
forever because you can recycle all of your dollars. Because here's the trick, especially when you buy something like Sony. Sony is the Apple of cameras now. You buy Sony or at least Canon and you buy it new. Here's what happens. You buy it new and in two to three years, you sell it for 60 to 70% of its value. But wait, there's more. You've also taken all those years of depreciation off of it on taxes, which means that you're recycling roughly 80 or 90% of your dollars when you sell it and buy the new one to upgrade because you'll buy the new version of the exact same thing at the same price that you bought it new. And sometimes they even lower the price that you rarely raise it, but you get all the new features, but you literally sell the thing at lenses retain 70 to 80% of their value. So you can either keep the lenses because they almost never update lenses for like eight years that it takes them and they still retain all that time layer. They retain like 70, 80% of their value even used. You got the usage out of it. You took all those years of depreciation and taxes. So that means you can recycle. You can recycle 70 to 90% of your dollars. Seven to nine out of every $10 that you spent, you can recycle them into the upgrade. That's the benefits of buying new. And nobody knows that. And here's the other thing. If you measure the value that you got out of something out of every usage you ever got out of it, divided across the thing. Well, the thing is you got all that value. You made all of your money back on it, theoretically, by that time. You've now sold it, so you're technically already up, and then you took the depreciations. You literally cannot lose money buying new gear if you do it properly. Right. If you buy the newest thing, you can't lose it. And here's the other thing with the Sony. The Sony is now all with just USB-C plugged directly into your computer, and you can live stream with no additional accessories in perfect quality. And that's one thing we've talked about, too, is that cost isn't always the equivalent of value. You know, yep. so you you're gonna spend that money, and I think in our I think a lot of times in our different um, platforms you see buy once, cry once, yeah. Because you know, like literally, there's the 10 watt UV that costs ten thousand, thirteen thousand dollars, and you're like, God, how am I gonna justify that cost? But then with what you can produce and how quickly you can produce and the quality you can produce, and that was one of the things they mentioned a few episodes ago, and it's very true. And if you don't like it, you know, people are gonna be able. They think they're getting a, a deal on something, and you're actually like you said, reaccruing value or, you know, cost back to yourself and gaining value. So yeah. anything that Very saves true. you time inherently makes you money. Yeah. Your time will disproportionately, anything that wastes your time is too expensive. And anything that saves you time is worth any price. Because the thing is that the value of time wasted is so disproportionate and the value of time saved is so disproportionate, especially if you have to, I'll give you a primary example. The reason that cameras and content and all these things pay for itself is like, let's assume that you have to make a hundred videos or take a hundred photos that are all deliverables. Whatever saves you time, if you have to do something a hundred times, if do if having the more expensive version reduces an hour, what's the value of a hundred hours of your life? Yeah. Right. So that's like and even if you want to quantify that, okay, whatever your hourly rate is, you could quantify that and go, oh. That's yeah, I, I come out ahead. Yeah, yeah. got to pay for yeah. itself. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So value time base of like, because I either keep that time and enjoy my life more, which is invaluable, or I have the option to sell that time and um, accrue money. And if I also value that money and then said, okay, if all of those time savings become asset investment, well, then saving time, making that money and then investing that money is disproportionately more valuable than saving the value of a dollar today. Mm. Right. Yep. Very true. And, and really good segue here, actually, while we're talking about time, uh, a lot of these guys do not have a lot of it already. What we do uh, when we're when we're working with our laser marking machines is very tedious to learn, and it takes hundreds of hours just sitting and practicing to perfect it. We don't necessarily have time to branch out and make sure we're everywhere online all of the time. I don't Uh, think you have to. So so where do we need to be? And remember, we're trying to reach customers to make sales, right? We're trying to what's the average to median age of your customer? uh, I would say uh, 25 to 55 would be like kind of the range. uh, But then disproportionately, um, yeah, disproportionately YouTube and Instagram. Mm hmm. And the thing is, if you post to Instagram, you get the double dick to Facebook and Facebook skews older and affluent. Right. There go. There's that aspect of it. Here's the other thing, though. The imagery and things that you do 
and what you get, it, it, depending on who you made a custom piece for, if you film the custom making of that piece, the thing is, or even with what you made, if there's a photo of that thing, that also has scalability and value too, because that can be interesting. And the thing is, it's easy to post that anywhere, by the way. Because when people say, oh, I don't have the time to be in all these platforms, well, here's the thing. If you make one piece of content that's really good, there are things to extrapolate from that content, and then it's a distribution game. And we all know that making content takes time, posting it doesn't. Yeah, not in comparison, that's for sure. Right, right. Therefore, part of it is we text people and we text them photos or memes or gift or emojis all the time. The same amount of time it takes to do that is the same time, amount of times it takes to post a photo or video that you profit from, which means as long as the content creation engine is there, the posting isn't actually a problem in terms of your time suck because there's always disposable time to post. We See, waste quite a bit of it. things too, the tools that you talked about, right? So the great thing is, and I don't think people realize this, for as far as marketing goes, it's cool that you've got the phone like you talked about. It's awesome that you got the really cool camera and you can make these things. But also knowing how to use Adobe Express for like actually scheduling your content because there's so many times that people don't look at the analytics of content. Like I don't think most people know from our uh, viewers, and I, I just learned it this year, so it's not like I'm some kind of genius. Um, but you can go in if you've got a business Instagram account and actually look at when, like the age of the people who are looking at your content, where they're from, when they're and looking at it. And what time they're online. Yes, when. And so that's where like I literally have used Adobe Express to drop things and I've started noticing I'm hitting over 10K more consistently on video views. It doesn't equate the likes and follows and sales, but either way, people are still seeing it and I'm getting out in front of people. Here's the thing. You don't know that it's not equating to sales because the thing is, how many times does anyone here need to see something before they commit to buying it? A hundred percent. Right. Like, three, like, like a, three, like five, image, ten, like six, anything. Yeah. A brand name, even that you don't, if a brand that you're not already loyal to, how many times do you have to interact with a brand that you're not already loyal to before you even consider buying from them? hundred. Oh, it could be oh, yeah, all a thousand times. Yeah. yeah. Dozens, so yeah. the thing is the exposure value of your own brand, and this is other people's issue with, they don't give things enough time and consistency because they don't see immediate upfront gratification. Someone who doesn't know you needs to see and hear from you dozens of times sometimes before they're willing to part with their wallet. Now, it might be, especially if they're like an ADHD person, they might engage or interact, but that's not them buying. That's not them buying. So the thing is, how many times do they need to do that before they buy? So you have to remember, because again, they also, if, like, especially as an older person, uh, and by that I mean just someone not in their 20s, you know? Like, you hear that, Alex? There's <laughs> less impulse buying. There's less impulse buying. The older yeah. you get, the less you're impulsive you are because one, you have brand loyalty, you respect money, <laughs> and you also have accumulated enough things to where a lot of times you're not thinking about needing more of them. But once you are sold on something, once you do commit, you're much more firm and you're much less fickle. So the thing is, young people are much more emotionally driven. And the thing is, older people, it's not to say that they're more utility driven, it's mm -hmm. that the threshold of reaching them on an emotional level requires more effort and more time spent. Mm -hmm. You got to go deeper with right. people. The older people are, the more depth required. They're not shallow anymore. They're not young and shallow anymore. You got to dig deeper with them in order to get them to do anything because and they're already they on a path. I think they don't focus on cost as much either as, as far as value too. And that's where you actually can actually make more money with those people because because you've told that story, because you've made that connection, like you said before, they're willing to go ahead and dig reach, like reach deep. Because I know there's certain items that as a young person, I wouldn't have bought. But now I look at it and I'm almost like, I deserve this. Let me treat myself, whatever that gratification. Not so instant, but like, you know, like you're saying, it kind of ties together with that. Thought. It's thoughtful. Yeah. It's also thoughtful. It's about like what state of my, like. So here's the thing. The storytelling and the marketing and needing to be in these platforms is also about understanding what state of mind your potential customer is in when they're on these other platforms. When someone's on Instagram, they're already conditioned to be someone who's paying attention to status because Instagram is all about conveying status. Wow. It Well, yeah, to a point, but like status is a different, and especially at different ages. When you're young, status is about clout. When you're older, status is about the life that you want to present because it's the life that you've earned.
Mm. So when you're when you're in your 30s and 40s, the things that you buy and the things that you surround yourself with, the thing you hang up in your house, the thing you hang up in your office, the things that you do are about, well, I deserve to be someone who can afford this thing. I deserve to be someone who gets to have this thing. I'm treating myself because I've worked hard, but it also is showing to other people, hey, here is the thing that I do for myself or here is how unique I am and look at this thing I have that makes me a little bit more um, unique, right? So the thing is, Instagram already conditions you to think about status and Instagram always makes you think about what else don't I have and what does it say about me that I don't have that or if I had that, what would it say about me, right? Hmm. So the thing is, Instagram from a status standpoint, if you're older, is about projecting the status of wanting to show where you've arrived in life and what you're capable of and what you've earned and what that means and who you are by proxy of that, right? When you're younger, Instagram status, I think, is largely trying to differentiate yourself from your friends or staying out in the pecking order of your friends, which is where the clout, clout is really a competition of a self-expression mm -hmm. lens through insecurity, I would say. Yeah. Whereas I would say the older you get, it's not that you lose the insecurity, it's that the way it manifests is very differently in saying, again, what I deserve to be able to afford and what I deserve to be able to have. Uh, and also a, here is how I, as someone at this stage in my life, choose to present at this stage in my life. So that is... I think the mindset, when you know that, that's why I say for the price point of the laser etching stuff, it's going to be that 38 year old dentist that buys it. It's going to be that person that's putting it up in the, you know, in their office like that, or it's going to be a mom and pop shop that wants something in the diner, you know, like uh -huh. that they own. It's going to be like, you know, it's going to be things like that to some extent. Whereas, Again, in the influencer world, an influencer that's catering to a younger market is trying to sell them a cool graphic t-shirt that shows how edgy or rebellious they are or that they're part of the joke or the meme. Mm -hmm. It's a completely different the buyer's in crowd. Right. It's a completely different buyer's mindset part of the in crowd. So the thing is, if you're trying to sell meme culture and graphic tees, TikTok all day, every day. TikTok is like, it's like, buy the merch, buy the merch. It's like, it's, you know, that's what you would do in TikTok. It makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if you're trying to sell to that husband and wife, like a custom engraved thing for their dentist office or for that 50 year old podcaster that wants an engraving on a table that they're going to use for their podcast and for their intro or to put up on the wall. Like that's a completely different market. And that's the market of someone who can be reached in a YouTube or an Instagram or a Facebook. Yeah. I've actually or at made, a physical event or at a physical event. I actually mm -hmm. made a uh, sign just like you're talking about, like literally this sign, but times 10 for a YouTube gamer who will remain anonymous, but basically his background lighting is exactly that so i made a big ass sign for him i think it was three foot by two foot and um yeah it was expensive and he was just like yeah you know it's really just about getting my name out there and i was like cool here's your bill <laughs> yeah exactly well exactly. like well my thing is roberto customizing engraving is done locally and online yes so that's kind of where my mind is at like i feel like i should focus local and hope for online sales later down the road but first build your brand locally or should be building online? And that's then, a good question. You know, like where do you want to leverage yourself? Uh, you're asking me, stuff? you're asking me whether you should farm or whether you should hunt. And I would tell you that if you don't want to starve, do both. Cause it's then well, cause is, the thing is, it goes back to you, what he said earlier. You can do what you do in person in town and now put it online. Right. Part of it. And, and here's the thing. You can identify, okay, the thing that you do in, in town, you know that there's a limit and there's a market cap. Mm -hmm. There's un, an unlimited market cap online though. There's an unlimited amount of customers. Here's the thing, with extra time and extra materials, you could make an item for the content itself that is bait to get custom online orders. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, there's no market cap. 
You have no idea if there's a whale in the audience with an unlimited budget. You have no idea if that whale is going to put that up, brag to all their friends on their platform or at their town. And then everyone in that town that has money comes to you and is like, oh, I'm going to go get it. Like, so you see, it's about this is also why, because by the way, all we're talking about with online is scaling trade shows. The same Mm -hmm. strategy for a trade show is just online at scale. I use Twitter. Do you know why I use Twitter? I use Twitter because it means, oh, great. I get all the benefits of being at a conference or networking event all day, 24 seven. And the thing is I can even automate some Twitter so that I have a booth at the trade show, AKA the online trade show that is Twitter right. all day, 24 seven on my behalf. And the bot is not there to simulate being a human. It's there to just post things that people can interact with. And then me, the human can come back to my booth and see who left stuff at the booth and then I can follow up and now I can follow up in person. You see mm-hmm. it's, but, but at least I have a presence at the booth. You see right. the booth right. is there. People can interact with my wares, put in orders, ask questions, whatever. Now I have follow up. It's lead generation. That's what a trade show is. So a trade show, if you, if you look at online business and e-commerce and you just realize, wait a minute, instead of having to have the upfront cost of franchising myself, buying land, opening up a new shop, filling up inventory, Every website, every social media platform, every post, every video, every piece of content is just a pop-up shop that can sell for me as a franchise. Every like, oh, Wait, every social media app that I have is a workforce. Every post that I make is a foot soldier in my army going out there and getting me leads, building my reputation, representing my brand, and bringing me income. My wife, Miranda, is actually watching right now, and she brought up a good point. Uh, she's just a little behind us, but uh, she said, I think a lot of brand new shops struggle to know who their audience is, though, and we see that they're focusing on every audience. Why is that dangerous, and how can we maybe, like, filter out, you know, when you put up a Facebook ad, right then it's like, you can reach 5 billion people. You don't want to reach 5 billion people. So where where, where do you stand on that? Create an audience avatar, create an audience avatar that has, who is you psychologically, but has maybe more money and time than you do. So create an audience avatar, create a surrogate for the audience, create an avatar and say, what do I like? What do I spend my money on? Because I know myself very well. So I'm like, okay, so I can cater to someone like me. Now, here's what I do. I'm like, okay, I'm 38. The version of me that I will cater to is the 28-year-old version of me who doesn't know what I know over these last 10 years. The version of me that I'll cater to is an 18-year-old version of me, which is actually smart enough to be a 25-year-old version. of The, the 18 version of me is a person who's a 25% uh, – sorry, a 25-year-old version of my peer group. So that's the reverse engineering for me. Right. You know? Yeah. Uh, slash yeah. humble brag. But like the <laughs> – <laughs> but so you see what I'm saying? If yeah, I just go yeah. back in time by increments of 5, 10, or 20, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, increments of time, from a knowledge base, I can cater to that person with absolute certainty that I know something you don't know. And I also know your future. And I also know what's going what mistakes you're going to make, what things would be better for you, what things you should avoid, and also know what you will and won't listen to if the advice is framed in a certain way. So reverse engineering a younger version of yourself is wildly practical. If you Mm -hmm. reach a certain level of success, reverse engineering a broke version of yourself is wildly practical. If you are a broke version of yourself, but you're smart, consider the possibility that if you had money, you may not be as wise. Therefore, if you have wisdom, talent, ability that was hard earned because of your lack of money, you had to be resourceful. There's a version of you out there somewhere that has your temperament, likes and dislikes, but had an easier life potentially, or just a good environment or circumstances, played their cards differently, but maybe doesn't have the skill because they didn't have to be as skilled because they didn't have as bad of a hand and didn't have to play it as well. Um, from a you know circumstances standpoint, they could take more losses, take more risk, whatever it is. Consider that there is a version of you that's more affluent, but less wise. So now how would you speak to that person? So reverse engineer an aspect of yourself that is lacking in one of many areas or categories and say, how would I create value for a version of me that's lacking this? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So is there a version of me that's young, has a lot of time, 
but no money. Great. I offer that younger version of me skills that would produce money because you have the abundance of time to put into skilling up. Okay. Is there a version of me that is maybe more bold and young and naive and a go-getter energetic and would take more risk? but doesn't know what an intelligent risk is, great. I have advice for that person to make the most of their courage and confidence while life hasn't beaten it out of them yet. That you see, you, you, yeah. you, so what you do is you reverse engineer yourself and then you find an aspect of yourself where if you were lacking this, here's what you would provide. So then you, are, you have a problem to solve. Most business owners' problem is that they're a solution in search of a problem. Right. You see, right. so that's the, that's their pro that's their thing. But if instead they say, what problems am I capable of solving for a person like me, but lacking blank. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you're able to do that, there's a genuine problem that you've already solved for yourself or someone like-minded. And then you can do that. And it makes sense now because you're saying, if I was blank, I would do this and I have done this and I could do this because dot, 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 dot. Hmm. So everyone here probably can say, you know what? If I was a broke 18 year old young man, here is what advice I would give you as somebody who's already lived through it. Mm -hmm. right. so, so the thing is you can productize a service by just reverse engineering a problem you've already solved in life for yourself and then apply that to the market of people that have your personality and temperament, but not your experience or not your resources or not your age and wisdom and maturity or have not been through the other end of an experience. Right. Hmm. Got it. And before we move on, because I want to talk about branding, but before we get to that, I just want to rapid, rapid fire a couple things at you and you just let me know if they're, if they're coming in or going out. Okay. All right. Uh, text. So Text on images. Still in. Still in. Okay. TikTok. On the way out. Reels. I can follow up on that later, by the way. I can follow yeah. up on that one. Yeah. Uh, Instagram Reels. In. In. Okay. We like that. Uh, doing sales in general, discounting products and items. In if you're older, out if you're not. Okay. Uh, email lists. In like Flynn and people will not do it. Okay. Competitive it. advantage. Nice. All right. We can talk more about that one too. And uh, good websites. Disproportionately in, in an age of censorship and cancel culture. Okay. Mm. Got it. Mm. Control I've got one more narrative. Quick. I've got one more for you. Free shipping. Yep. Free in, shipping. in a recession, if you can afford it. Yeah. Out if inflation has been eating you up. <laughs> good one. Uh, and last but not least, and you can rapid fire this one and then we can expand on it. But with all of this talk about posting on all of these different platforms and who we're trying to reach and who our audience is. Again, you can narrow in, you can narrow in and you don't have to be everywhere. Not all at once anyway. Mm -hmm. We mentioned this, but buying ads in or out, are we relying on that organic reach or do we like buying ads? Remember what I said about harm hunting and farming? Yeah, both. <laughs> both got it yeah. so where so where do we stand I, how how big of a role is the algorithm playing in today's social media world and Everyone is that is, something people need to worry about or should you social, just be consistent they need, it's not that they need to worry about or not worry about they need to understand what it is what do you think an algorithm is <laughs> numbers ones and zeros so it's not a god it's, way, yeah. it's a it's not it's not a god it doesn't care about you it's not implicitly biased it's a machine it is a damn database and people are sitting here like, like an algorithm. You know what an algorithm is? An algorithm is when I go into Amazon and I buy something and I buy Levi's or something over and over again, it knows that, you know, Roberto likes Levi's jeans. If there's a sale on Levi's jeans, there's a good chance that he'll buy more Levi's jeans. So that means that the algorithm isn't tricking me into buying more of what I've already bought. It knows what I'm buying. It knows that trying to show me George Walmart brand pants isn't going to cut it because I'm a Levi's guy, I'm a brand loyalist. It's like not even going to bother. It knows. Don't recommend Roberto a large. He's a medium. He mm. always buys medium. Recommend a medium. <laughs> like it knows. Roberto's a Sony guy. Don't show him Canon. He's not. He's going to leave the website. 
Like, so all it does is observe what I'm already doing and then say, what will get Roberto to give me more money based on what Roberto's doing? Which means it doesn't have to convince me of anything. It's not its job is not to convince me. It's not there to trick me. It is there to observe and measure and record my behavior and not interfere beyond extracting money from me. Hmm. And that's the Amazon algorithm, by the way. Right. Do you yeah. really think that social media algorithms are more nefarious by their nature than trying to extract money and time from you based on what it's observed about what you are already doing? It's just presenting opportunity. Like on Boyce's computer, I'm sure that this uh, Royal Crown Peach Tea would be something that pops up. On mm -hmm. So what do we? So what do we do with that, man? Like, is that if anything, or do we just go on with our lives and hope that so we're posting stuff that gets picked up by the you, by the wave? If you understand that every algorithm is just a slickster stale salesman in a store that's just watching like a hawk, what he buy, what he buy, what he buy, what he buy. And then says he likes that brand or he picked that up and put that down. And they're like, and is just making a mental calculate. If you realize that all the machine is, is a very dumbed down version of the best salesperson in the world that's just watching you in the store. And not because they're worried about you stealing something, but because they just want to know <laughs> how to swoop in and sell you. If you realize that that's all it is and what it might be selling you is, okay, if you watch these videos, and you watch more of them. I just got to get you to watch more of these videos. Why do I want to get because like because I sold the advertisers already on the inventory for these videos. So I need to monopolize your attention because I promised your attention to the advertisers and I pre-sold them. I pre-sold the advertisers. So now I need you to watch as much stuff as possible. And it doesn't like it's like I don't care what you watch. I just need you to watch something because I sold inventory against it. So that's the algorithm. The algorithm's job is, all right, I already sold the advertisers. I already sold the, I need eyeballs. I need eyeballs. I need eyeballs. I need these eyeballs as long as possible because I got more inventory to move. And so that's what the algorithm is, right? All it is is trying to say, what will you watch so that I can move inventory because I promised these advertisers and they're going to be at my door and they're going to be like, "Where's where, where are my views? Where are my views? Where are my views? And if I don't have them, it's going to be a problem. So like, so if you understand that that's the racket, if you, if you understand that the social media companies went out and they, they sold a bunch of inventory and they promised the advertisers views and that their goal is how can I get you to give me attention so that I can tell the advertisers that I met my quota, I've met their demands and that the requisite number percentage of eyeballs that convert to 1% in sales for them to make their numbers so that they can go back to their overlords, the shareholders. If you understand the racket that you're in, at least at a fundamental basic level, then there's no superstition about the algorithm. And I, so I'm explaining it in the sense of, I want so, you to the, be less the, superstitious the, mm -hmm. and realize that the algorithm is only there and it's only really all the algorithm is, is your analytics in any platform. It's like an echo of yourself. And that those analytics are just a measurement of the behavior of an audience. So if the analytics and the audience are the truth, then that's what the algorithm is. So here's the thing. If you can anticipate your audience because you know them and then verify that with the data, the analytics are showing you. If you can get into your audience head and anticipate them, you aren't worried about chasing trends because you're ahead of the curve because you know the audience. So it's like, oh, I know my people and I'm always able to anticipate their needs and service. And that's good customer service. That's good observational skills as a sales and marketing person. So then, okay, you are only using analytics then to verify what you already know or to test and say, oh, I didn't know that. And then if that's the case and you're able to verify what you already know, or debunk something you didn't you you know or discover something new then that's useful and then if you serve the audience the algorithm is just going to say i now see that you are capable of serving the audience oh you're getting more people what you want hey i know more people like that i know more people like that what if i put your stuff in in front of you've proven that you can make people enjoy something mm -hmm. if i know more people like the people you already pleased i can send them your way so that's all an algorithm is. An algorithm will reward someone who understands the audience better than anyone else. 
and anticipates what they will actually do and can see through the lie they say about what they like and what they do and can just watch their behavior and say, I'm going to not, I'm going to ignore everything you said and I'm only going to pay attention to what you actually do. The creator, business owner, marketer, performer, entertainer, educator that can figure out what people will actually do and how that differs from what they say they will do figures out what they actually like versus what they say they will like, mm -hmm. that person will win and the algorithm will reward them because all the algorithm is there to do is fulfill demand with supply. If you get ahead of and you understand where demand will be, if you understand where the ball will be, you don't have a problem. Right. So you can skip over an algorithm in terms of a fear or concern. All you have to do is serve an audience an algorithm that un that can measure how you served the audience will find more people who can be served like that because it's fulfilling it's it's yeah it's trying to get it's trying to fulfill that it's in its best interest yeah it's in its best interest it's no different than okay if you are on the sales team and I figured out that there's a customer profile that you sell to very well and then there's a customer profile that you don't sell to very well I'm only going to put people in your pipeline that you can sell and close because right. that would be my best bet. And the thing is, if I can confirm that with data, that's like, you know what? Boyce does really great with selling young men, but he's terrible at selling middle-aged women. So you know what I'm going to do? It's like, I'm going to send all the middle-aged women to Matt because they love the cut of his jib. And I'm going to send every young <laughs> whippersnapper over to Boyce. And it's like, and now everyone's optimized to close. It's like, boom, that's yeah. mm -hmm. all the algorithm is trying to do is it's trying to sort out who you cater to best. But when you're all over the place, you have no clarity, no focus, or when you're inauthentic, it struggles to do that. Yeah. So all you have to do is get out of your head and realize that the, the reason this database and system exist, the, the reason that this thing exists is just to address demand and make sure there's enough inventory in the supply chain for it. Cool. Mm -hmm. That's a really thorough answer. Thank you. I yeah, I appreciate. Sorry that. about I, that. No, I really, it's okay. Yeah. No, I I loved it. I'm sure that that I don't think people, people listening, think of it that way. Yeah, yeah, nobody thinks of it that way. Especially people that watch our channel. We're not the most tech savvy uh, <laughs> bunch, so I I really appreciate the normal English that you used instead of trying to get technical about it because everybody loves to get technical about it. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it doesn't need to be that, that complicated. I'm a sure. gearhead, but I love storytelling. I love analogies. And I love humanizing things. I'm a gearhead, mm -hmm. but I really love just bringing it down to earth. And yeah. I, I, we're coming right up on an hour here. I have one I more question. I can go over a little bit. I, I, little I bit. have one more question for you if you have time, because this is something I really want to, to touch on. So in your description of your YouTube channel, you say you are trying to help people build brands and businesses online. Yep. What the hell is a brand? What is a brand? A brand, for lack of people who don't know, is a combination of your reputation, your body of work, and your overall uh, network the relationships that you have. So when people, I know people are confused by the marketing jargon, but I want you to think about this. Brands come from the ancient you know, world and the concept of a brand would be a physical thing. It's branding and it would be a mark, but it's also a mark can be also called something else. A brand could be called a sigil. A brand can be called a crest. A brand, and we often think of these things mm -hmm. as a logo. Now the thing is a brand isn't just a logo, but it does kind of encompass that because a logo is more than what it is in in the Game of Thrones universe, for example, your how sigil is more than that. It's the representation of your family, your armies, your lands, your crown, all of that, but also your house words like "winter is coming" or "we do not sow" or "a, a Lannister always pays their debts." So, so it's a thing is, and the thing is, it conveys who you are and the words that you stand by and what you. I uh, mean, if you're a Targaryen, it's fire and blood. So it's it's talking about the conquest of Aegon when he came to King's Landing. So it's the story. A brand is largely representative of just um, symbology, words, and things that are your story. And your story is your reputation. Because remember, Game of Thrones analogy, your reputation, the family you come from, it says everything about you. It says, here is our prowess in battle. Here is the history of our lineage and the great kings and queens and people that we came from and what they did and what we're about. F around and find out, right? That's what Game of Thrones life is like, right? That's what right. life in Westeros is. <laughs> Thank you for speaking right. my language here. I appreciate it. Yes. So like, 
So the thing is, when you see that symbol, you're like, oh, I know who those people are. I know what they're about. And what is that? That is their reputation. And what was that reputation built on? The body of work, their the great deeds that they've done, good or evil, the things that they did that they're remembered for. What what else is it? It's your allies. It's the, oh, that house is aligned with that house. That house is married into that family. If I mess with them, I'm messing with this group, this group, this group. So it's, so it's your, so it's your, that's a network. Those are alliances. That's your network. That's who's on your side. Okay. So that's your power by proximity is represented in your brand. So your, brand is ultimately yes what you represent what you stand for your values your reputation for standing by and honoring those values and those words the message it's what people say about you when you're not in the room it's also who knows you and what your relationship with those people are so again your networking relationships but it's also your body of work of is that reputation merited and is it earned and by what And by what? So the thing is, when I want to help someone build their brand, what am I saying? I want to help you learn how to make better things. Maybe you need to learn the tools of your trade. Maybe you need to learn technique. Maybe you need to, but it's the goal of helping you make something that you can then be known for. If you make something, then you have an earned reputation. If you have an earned reputation that's valuable to somebody, you can build a relationship with them. And now you have a network. Now you also not only have the the power and the name that you've earned with your own work, but also through the proximity of who will vouch for you and who values that work work and who also can back up and say that you're a person of your word and that you're a person who stands by their deeds and the quality of their deeds. Yeah. I was so gonna, I was going to ask I mean. you too. Yeah. I was going to ask you what makes a good brand, which you just answered. And <laughs> then I was going to ask you, is a good brand one that's authentic, which you also just answered. Uh, you know, so the last question that I have for you today, and we'll close on this one is, is it dangerous to reinvent yourself or to reinvent your brand or should you stick to it once you have it and just kind of cling on to it for dear life forever and have you ever rebranded yourself you know what were the consequences of that yeah yeah can we talk about that consistency can't come at the expense of context and context is true authenticity so the thing is in life you a person who doesn't change has not lived a person who doesn't change has not lived Because if you truly live rather than just existing, you'll be presented with things in life that will force you to change your mind, change your position, to uh, meet the standards of the world and to meet your own expectations. A person who hasn't changed, hasn't changed their own standards, hasn't axed more of themselves. If you haven't changed as a person, that means you haven't challenged yourself. You haven't grown as a person. You haven't grown and adapted and evolved and everything like that. So the thing is, that means you're existing in life because that also means you're not in the arena. You're not doing anything confrontational, combative. You have nothing to challenge you. And so uh, that's not even just about baseline stability because, by the way, maintaining stability and equilibrium still requires you to rise to challenges because the world isn't static. The world will inevitably challenge you. For most people, it doesn't inherently get better unless they do. So the thing is, your life will force you to change. Now, if things force you to change, you have to understand that you have to take actions in the interest of your truth and your authenticity, but weigh that against what this means because it will impact your reputation. And so the thing is, you can change your actions, but you still might have to do that through the lens of your value system. But your value system can grow, evolve, and change, and it should if you're a mature person. It should. It should. Because the thing is, you're someone who has to exist in the world, and that means being able to coexist with other people as well. So the thing is, you have to account for that. So your fundamental foundation of who you are, the core of who you are, if it was built on good values, will not have to dramatically or inherently change that much year to year. But decade to decade, absolutely for sure. But incrementally and over time and when presented with a good reason in context and that also by the way if you grow in skill ability knowledge your network grows you're exposed to more things more people more resources you learn to manage new resources learn to utilize new tools you're doing the things appropriate to the world then that also changes your body of work 
And therefore, that changes your reputation. It also changes who you know. So those things, your brand inevitably evolves and it evolves to also exist in the time in which you live or it probably won't survive those times as well. Right. So yeah. inherently, so I think someone has to evolve their brand and change with the times. I don't think that has to be dramatic. I think that that is incremental and it's fine. And I think that if there is a paradigm shift in what you do or your industry, people who refused and clung to film instead of digital made a terrible mistake in the name of vanity because they decided to ignore context in favor of romanticism. So I think that the evolution of your brand should happen through a practical lens, not an emotional one. That's great. I, if you could just one more time for me, uh, smash that button that makes everybody cheer for you. Can you do that? Can you hit that one? Roberto Blake, everybody. Best-selling author. <laughs> Create something awesome. You can pick it up right now. There's a link down in the description. You can get it on Kindle. There's a hardcover and a soft cover. Yep. Uh, really great. I just placed my order this afternoon. I can't wait to read it. Yep. Yeah, oh, man. Was... Oh, look at that. Look at that. And uh, h hit this guy up on YouTube. He's got 560 some odd thousand subscribers for a reason. He's spitting stuff like this all the time. Really, really, really great information. So go hit him up if you aren't already. Uh, I'd just like to thank my co-host for hanging out with me today. Great questions, guys. Uh, really, really good time. Roberto, dude, thank you so much for spending. I know how valuable your time is. I really appreciate you coming on today to, to talk to our gang and, uh, and, and kind of school us a little bit on some of this stuff because I know it's an area that we struggle in and we're very technical over here at Laser Everything. We don't talk about this kind of stuff very often. So, I, I, you know, it's, it's extra appreciated that you took the time to come It's not a problem. It's, it's my hope that more people are able to leverage the tools that we have at this time, maybe get a little bit more business sales and marketing savvy. I know that that's a weakness that technical and creative people have, but we live in a new world. The creator economy means business, creativity, and tech are intersecting and anyone who can take advantage of it absolutely should. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, guys, remember, if you got value out of today's episode of the podcast, don't forget to smash the like button. Uh, let everybody else know that you got value out of today's cast. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you get notified the next time we go live. If you love the channel and everything we do here, please go check out the LMA. It's the number one way to support the channel, and it allows us to continue doing the things that we do here. It's a viewer supported channel. That's how we make the bulk of our income. That's why we have voice. That's why we have Kyle. That's why we have Amanda working on the website. That's why my wife got to quit her job so that we can all be here managing all these communities, doing all this stuff for you on YouTube. It's viewer supported, guys. As viewers supported, and you can find out more about that over at masters.lasereverything.net. That's all I've got for you guys today. Thank you so much for listening, and we will see you in the next one.